Amen. How's everyone doing today? And beautiful day out today. Fall is approaching. Amen. Sometimes it feels like summer, sometimes it feels like fall, and I get a little bit confused, you know, as it's, it's wicked, just like really hot and humid one day, and the next day it's kind of chilly, and uh, just kind of in that transition um, period of, of, of seasons, you know, in these past few weeks, uh, you know, I've noticed the, the change of seasons just by what's going on in the, in the neighborhood, you know, school started recently, and uh, kids are back to the grind, they're back in school, and uh, even just a few weeks ago, I see, see kids, even in the summer summertime, beginning of August, and, uh, and they're, they're walking up the road. They've got their, their football gear on. They're going heading up to the high school to, to start practicing for football, and, it's, uh, and uh, you know, I'm sure it's a, even 90-degree weather. They've got all their gear on. They're walking up there with their helmets and everything, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's great. And you know, at this time of year, football season's starting. I already hear some conversation buzzing around about football and the, the games that are, that are coming up. You know, now, to me, that's a sure sign of fall amen it's happening you know and people just really religious about about football itself and god forbid you you miss church because of football don't be don't do that but you know um you know and it's uh, rushing home after church putting on the game and you're on do not disturb mode and they've got everything tuned out as you're you're watching the the game after church or whatever but it's that time of that time of year it's in that season football is just kind of a you know, just a, a, an American tradition, and you know, and probably the most amazing football game I've ever seen actually is is back in 2017, the Super Bowl. Anybody remember that? The Patriots against the Falcons. It was like a miraculous defeat. It was a miraculous game that I've never seen a game like that before. Being raised and born and raised in New England, I kind of, by default, I kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a Patriots fan, so I kind of go in that direction. Some of you might be booing me right now, and that's all right. And, uh, but, you know, and uh, I remember that game so vividly and, and watching that game being so severely disappointed. So severely disappointed, they were they just were, were fumbling and just not, not making any scores, and it, it was 10 minutes left to the game, and the score was like, like Falcons 28, the Patriots 9, and at that point, 10 minutes left to the game, I'm like, I'm just going to turn this off and go to bed, and I'm not even going to waste my time. This is the lamest game that I've ever watched in my life. I'm so incredibly disappointed. Anybody remember this? TV was off. I went upstairs. I brushed my teeth, got ready to bed, got into the bed. I put my, my phone was on my, my nightstand, plugged in for the night, really wasn't going to pay attention to that. But then all of a sudden, I got this notification. I'm like, ah, my phone went off. I looked at it, and it was a notification from the news. The New England Patriots have scored another point. Then another notification, then another notification, then another notification. Ten minutes left to the game. And, and I, I'm like, well, what's going on here? So I got dressed again. I went downstairs, and I, I, I turned on the TV again. And I'm, I'm watching in amazement what's happening as they race against the clock. <laughs> Time was ticking. The clock was ticking. It seemed like it wasn't going to happen. And, and, and everything just seemed in these last moments like, to, to accelerate it was touchdown after touchdown, and they're, and they're working against the clock, and they had this miraculous co comeback. And in the final moments, the Pat New England Patriots won the game. It all happened in the final moments, and uh, we're talking about the final moments here in the book of Revelations. The book of Revelation is a, is a book about final moments. This is week two about the seven churches. Last week, we, we, talked, of, we talked about, are we living in the last days? And we, and we, and we tried to answer that question and, when, and, and, uh, and see what God, what God is speaking to the churches. And this week, we're going to be talking about chapter, starting in chapter two. And uh, we're going to be talking about today about the God's, just what God is saying to the church. See, the book of Revelation is a book about the final moments. It's a prophetic book about what is to come, and he has some encouragement. It's in, he has actually a, a love letter inside of it speaking to the church, to the, to the body of Christ in these last days. It can, it can, the, the, in, in, in the letters that we're going to be talking about to the seven churches are specific letters to specific churches at a specific time. But they can be interpreted prophetically, pastorally, and personally to our lives today. Amen? 
I believe that, you know, when we look around in the, in the world that we live in today, we see all the natural disasters and we see all that, that's going on in the, in the world around us. We look at the Middle East and, and all that's going on in Israel. We see all this stuff going on. It seems like chaos in the world. It seems like there's a, a lot of things happen that just aren't explainable. And all these, these natural disasters that are increasing, earthquakes that are happening at an increasing rate. And we wonder, does this mean something? Does, does all this war, all this hatred, all this chaos, does the, this, lack of immor- this lack of morality, is it, is, does it mean something? Is it a sign of the time that we're living in? What was once evil is now good, and what was good is now evil. I believe that these are the greatest days for the church. These are the greatest days for the the church of Jesus Christ. And these are the days that the apostles in the New Testament, they long to see these last days. Did you know that God is moving on this earth like never before? Did you know that people are being saved and, 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 and the miraculous and, and God is moving in an unprecedented way in this world? Well, we might not see as much here in America, but it's happening in America. God is moving. You go to, in Africa, lives are being changed. There are crusades of thousands and even sometimes millions of people hearing the gospel all at one time. The, the church and, and the underground church in China is exploding where lives are being changed and, 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 the, and, and, and the church of Jesus Christ is being multiplied upon multiplication. God is moving. Jesus is doing something miraculous even in the Middle East. And there's testimonies of visitations of Jesus Christ to Muslims and they get saved right there. God is moving in this earth. God is moving in this world in these last days. These are moments that those who wrote the Bible long to see. And we're going to be talking about it. And God chose you to live in this day and age for such a time as this. To use you to do the work that he's called you to do. Because you have a purpose in this world. He, he created you with a purpose, with a plan, with a ministry to this world. You have something to offer this world that nobody else has to offer. You could have been born in 1637 in a a faraway country. You could have been born in, in, in Papua New Guinea or something like that back in the 1600s. But God has chose you to be born here, to live here, to live in this time for such a time as this. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And I believe that he's he's strategically placed you and positioned you position this church in these final hours to bring the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. See, the book of Revelations was written to specific specific, um, people in a specific time in a specific place. And and in these these next chapters that we read in in chapter 2, actually we're going to start in chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, and go into chapter 2. We read of letters to specific churches. Churches that, that Paul had a tremendous influence and, and had part in, in starting these churches all around Asia Minor. There are churches of influence. There are churches that, were, 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 that had different qualities about them. Oftentimes in Scripture, Paul mentions churches. He writes letters to churches. But in this instance, John the Apostle was on the island of Patmos. And he was, he was put on the island of Patmos as a prisoner because of preaching the gospel. Did you know that in the past hundred years, more people have been, have been persecuted for being Christians than all of the other centuries before us? he was persecuted for being a Christian. He was persecuted for preaching the gospel. And it was there in those moments, in that time of persecution, when he was in prison in Patmos on a, on a barren island, he received a revelation from heaven. And that is the book of Revelation. We're going to read it today in Revelations 1, 19 through 20. He said, write, therefore, what you have seen, 
what is now and what will, will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand in the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The word angels here actually means messenger, and more specifically the, to the pastors. He's writing a letter. Jesus is writing letters to the pastors to, to give to the church. Imagine me coming to church one day and say, hey, guys, I've got, I got this letter, and it's from Jesus. <laughs> How much weight that would have. Our ears would be tuned. <laughs> We'd be listening. What is Jesus saying to the church? And today I believe that God is speaking to the church. I believe that God is speaking to, to the body of Christ. I believe that God is doing something in his final moments of, of the church. And, and the first message that he gave, the first church that he wrote to in the book of Revelations was to the church of Ephesus. And he gave them this message, return to your first love. In Revelations 2, 1 through 5, he said this to the, to, the, to the church in Ephesus. He said, to the angel of the church of Ephesus writes, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. He says, I know, remember, this is Jesus talking. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people, and that you've tested those who claim to be apostles, but they are not, and have found them false. You have, perse you have pers persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you, that you have forsaken your love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you fir did first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove the lampstand from its place. You know, you can be a church, and we can be individuals <laughs> that do not shine the light into this world. We can still be a church, but not shine the light out into this world. And, and Jesus' heart for us is to, to be the light, on, the light on the hill, to be the light of the world. You see, the, the church of Ephesus was a very unique church. It was, like, it was a mega church. It was a big church. Their reaching people was very large, and they were doing a lot of things right. And Jesus, he was commending them for what they did. They were commending him for them for, for what they did right. He said, you guys are doing so many things right, but here, I, I, want, I want to draw you closer to me and give you some direction here. But did you know that you could still be doing everything right and still be completely wrong? They're doing everything right. They're doing what they were supposed to do, but it was more like a religious mindset. These are, this is what we're doing. This is how we do it. They had form, but without their heart involved. You see, a lot of marriages end up this way. They end up in the same, in the same, in the same direction. Just like, just like marriage, you get busy and you get distracted with all the cares and the worries of the world and you, and you lose focus and you, you lose concern for what is really most important. Have you ever been there? Get distracted, lose focus on what really is important? was formed without heart, with, and, and without their heart involved. It was, it was doing the, the work of Christianity without the, the heart of Christianity. It, it's knowing it up here, but, but not really knowing it down here. Where they were once passionate, where they were once, when they were once move, operating in, in love, their, because of their love for Jesus Christ, their love for people. And somewhere down the road, they lost it. See, Jesus begins with those who have left, their, who left their, their first pure love for God. And every relationship is in this danger of going stale. Every relationship, every relationship that we don't pay attention to, that we don't spend quality time with, that we don't take time to develop, has a danger of going stale. And we lose that first love, that passion that we once had. Do you remember when you first accepted Jesus Christ, when you first experienced salvation, that passion, that desire, that fire that you had within you? 
I remember when I was first saved and I first got, 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 got received Christ, I remember I was just so passionate about Jesus Christ, and, and I was in a church, and, and it was like I was doing something wrong because I was on fire for Jesus, because I, I loved him so much, and, and people would be saying things like this, I mean, yeah, yeah, it, that's cool and everything, but you know, it's, someday you'll get used to it, you know. Don't ever let anybody tell you that. Don't ever let somebody else influence your passion and your love for Jesus. Keep that fire burning. Do whatever it takes to, to, to maintain that fire and, and that, that first love, that passion that you once had when you first got saved. And if you've fallen away from the, that passionate desire for Jesus, do the works that you did first. Remember where you came from. Remember those, those days. Remember what he saved you from. He's looking for a surrendered heart, what it comes down to. A heart that's surrendered. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 says, Jesus said to him, you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind." And this is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The, the, the rela our relationship with God is expressed in two ways. Our love for God, because of our love for God, we love others. That same love that he, that he, that he puts inside of our heart flows out of us into other people. But along that line, the, the, that, that love becomes stale. Because we're not, we're not spending that time with him. We're not, we're, not, we're not investing in that relationship with him. We're not spending time in prayer. We're not spending time in his word. Have you lost your fire? Have you lost your passion for him? Get into his word. Get into his word. Take some, some time and pray. Take some time and, 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 and worship him and, and, and spend that time with him. Because when you spend time with one another, when you spend time with your, with your spouse, when you spend time with your friends, that, that relationship grows closer and closer. And you have something that you don't have with anybody else. And God desires for us to have intimacy with him, to have a, a passionate, on fire relationship with him, and to experience his love, to experience his power. The church of Smyrna, he said this to them. He encouraged them in this way. He said, remain faithful. Remain faithful. In Revelations 2, 9 through 11, it says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but, but are, are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And, and, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And those who are, who is, and, and the, the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. You see, there's a lot of trials. that The Bible says that if we will follow Christ, we will suffer tribulation, that we will suffer persecution. But the key thing that we need to remember in all that, that the Bible also says that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. What do conquerors do? They conquer. They don't complain about their situation. They don't complain about how hard it is or the obstacle that we're facing. We are conquerors and we conquer. That's who that we are because of what God has done in our hearts, because of Jesus Christ and the power that dwells within us. Amen? I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. A conqueror conquers. I don't complain about my situation, but I, but, but I know that God is faithful. I know that he's victorious. The world may come, come against me. I may, I may have all the, just all the troubles in the world right now, but I know that God is faithful and he's going to see me through. I know that God is faithful. Right now, there's Christians all around the world who are paying the price for being, for, for being Christians, for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. All 
all around the world. 50-something countries, it's illegal to even own one of these, to have it in your house. But yet here in the United States, we, we experience minimal, very minimal persecution as Christians, as believers in Jesus Christ. We're blessed because we, we get to freely assemble like this, like here today. We're, we're able to read the Bible freely. We're able to express our faith freely. People may not always like it. People may not always agree, but God bless America. We're allowed to disagree with one another. Amen? But God has blessed us. And to the church of Pergamum, he had this encouragement to them. He said, cancel your compromise. What is God saying to the church? What is God saying to us today as a church, as, as individuals? And he said in, in Revelations 2, 13 through 16, I know where, he's not, not trying to be creepy here where he says, I know where you live. <laughs> he's saying, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my, my, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have few things against you. There are among you, there are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, and so that he ate, ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is the, the, the sword of the mouth, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. You see, this church, what happened to them, they got out of balance doctrinally. They got sidetracked on every wind of doctrine. They got sidetracked on the, on the truth of God. They didn't hold fast to the truth of God's word. And it's important for us not to compromise the truth of God's word, but to hold fast to it. We live by this book. We live by the word of God. Everything that we, that we believe, everything that we live by comes out of the word of God. These are the words that we speak. These are the words that we meditate on. These are the promises that we hold on to. And this is where faith comes from. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's word is true. The Bible says that his promises are yea and amen, that he's not a man that he should lie. But they got off track. They, they got off track and, 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 and compromised doctrinally. They compromised. You see, the Nicolaitans, they were coming into the church And, they were, and they were, they're, 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 they're infecting the church with sin and saying, you know, it's all right to do this. What the Bible clearly said was wrong. They were preaching a gospel that said what was, what was, what was right at one time is wrong, and what's, what's wrong is right. And they were, they're, they're infusing the church with compromise. They're saying, you know what, the, like, like we see so many Christians saying today, you know what, the Bible, it was written at that time, and those morality standards were for then and not now. The truth changes. This is 2018. God understands. The Bible, though, it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That his word is established in heaven. We can't change God into, to, to meet our feelings and our needs. And what so many people do today is they, they violate one of the commandments. They form a God in their, in, their, in their own image, a God of their own liking, a God that suits their needs. You see, my God, he doesn't do that. My God, he, he, he accepts this. My God. And we, and we form a God that suits our needs, to suit our lifestyle, to suit what, the way that we want God to look like. But well, the Bible says, I am God and I change not. I don't change for you. I don't change. He, he's God. We aren't. And to the church of Thyatira, his encouragement was, remove impurity. Guys, remove the impurity in your church. 
I said to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, those whose, are, whose eyes are like blazing fire and those whose feet are like are burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your, persever- your perseverance. You guys got a lot going on here. You're now doing more than you first did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate this woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and eating of of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. There's somebody in this church, there was somebody in this church that was really upsetting things, that was really causing a commotion, that was really bringing poison and bringing sin and immorality in the church and, and bringing people along with her. And it was cancerous to the work that God had for that church. But, so I will cast her out on a bed of suffering, and I will I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. So it's encouraging the church to inspect for immorality. See, Jezebel, back in the Old Testament, was the most, most, most evil woman that, that the Bible talks about. She was a, a woman who, who harassed the prophet Elisha. She was an immoral woman who was, who, was, who was domineering, controlling, and had a tremendous influence on her husband Ahab and, and how he should run the country and the run, the, the run the kingdom. And this lady, again, in the book of Revelation, shows up at a church. Her name is Jezebel with the same spirit bringing corruption, bringing immorality into the church. And she was in the church teaching people that this immorality is cool and it's all right. And saying that things are all right, that God clearly, clearly was keeping us from. Then it says in verse 24 that then I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and, and, and does and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter, will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my Father, I will also give the one, that one, the morning star. This is Jesus talking. And now to the church of Sardis. Renew your passion. He was encouraging them to renew. Remember, this is Jesus talking. He was talking to this church, and he, and, he, and, he, and he sees the good in every church, and he sees, the, he sees the, the works, he sees the passion, he sees the heart. But his heart here, these are like love letters, and how we, how they, the, to draw them closer to himself and to a deeper relationship. And I believe that today he's calling us to a, a deeper relationship with him. A deeper relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. A deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, the church of Sardis was basically asleep. There was no power. There was no anointing. There was no moving of the spirits. They were just going through the motions. There was nothing that would say that they were alive, even though, they, even though it seemed like they're, they, 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 they announced that they were alive and that they're vibrant, but inside they're really asleep and dead. And Jesus was saying, come alive, renew your passion, renew that passion that you once had. And in Revelations 3, 1 through 3, it says, and to the angel of church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds and I have a reputation, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. It seems like they had something going on. It seems like the spirit of God at one time was moving in that church. It seems like that, that, that something that was happening inside of them that was remarkable and people knew them far and wide as a church where the Spirit of God was moving with power and with anointing. But over time, they fell asleep. There's many movements within this country, within the body of Christ, who were once very alive, 
where great revival, where great moves of God came forth out of these movements. And now if you walk into those churches, they're like mortuaries. You think you're in a town meeting. There's no power. There's no anointing. The word of God is not preached with, a, with, with anointing. There's no sense of God's spirit. It's kind of like going through the motions, going through these religious motions and the, these do's and these don'ts and, and, and just going to church and doing your duty and just, just, just doing what you're supposed to do. But this church had something going for them at one time and, and, and Jesus is, is, is urging them, come back to where you were again. Come back to your first love. Come renew your passion in me. Be who, yet you, who I've called you to be. So he says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. What does he say in verse 2? He says, but wake up. They're spiritually asleep. He's saying, and he's speaking the word. He's saying, wake up. Wake up. You're slumbering in the spirit, but wake up. I'm calling. I'm speaking life into you once again. If you will receive it, receive this life, receive this revival, receive this renewal inside of your heart, you'll once again You'll once again live in that passion. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. The Bible says, stir up the gift of God that is within you. God has imparted in every single one of you a measure of faith. God has imparted in you gifts and a passion and a spark of fire, a flame of fire. And for some of us, it seems like there's just this little remnant of a spark that remains inside of us. But the Bible says, stir up that gift. The stir up that gift like you're, you're stirring up that coal bed, trying to get that fire moving again. Well, so many times we're waiting for God to do it. But he said, stir up the gift. You do it. I've already given it to you. Be a steward of what I've given you. Stir up that gift. Make those right choices. Make those, take those steps of faith. Take those, those moves to, 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 to be who God has called you to be. He says, remember what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. And if you, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you'll, and you'll not know at what time I will come to you. Asleep. And so many believers today are asleep in the body of Christ, not ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ, not ready for the rapture of the church. Asleep. Slumbering. He said, if you don't wake up, I will come like a thief, and, I, and you'll not know at what time I will come to you. The rapture of the church, the instantaneous snatching away of believers. And the Bible says that he will come as a thief in the night. He'll come unexpectedly to save us from the, the time of trouble to come, the, the seven years of great tribulation. And this is a time of joy, and this brings comfort to believers. And, and, and Paul spoke this, and Paul taught this in, the, in, in his letters to the churches to bring comfort to believers. But so many in the body of Christ these days are lulled to sleep by unbelief. They're, they're lulled to sleep by, the, by the, the cares and the worries of this world. They're, they're lulled to sleep by the materialism of this world, by the cares of life. And to the church of Philadelphia, his encouragement to them was operate in obedience. And this is the secret to the Christian life. It's not obey because I told you so. It's obey out of a heart. Because we love him, we do. We don't do to prove that we love him. But because we love him, we do. And as we take those steps of obedience, as we take those steps of faith, we enter into the promise, into the purpose that God has for our life. It's living a life of surrender. In Revelation 3, 7, 8, it says, To the church, the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is, is holy and true, who holds the, keys, the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, you have kept my, but yet you have kept my word. 
Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And this is the only church that didn't, that didn't get rebuked. I would hate to get rebuked by Jesus. <laughs> You're getting a letter like, all right, guys, this is, I mean, you need to go in another direction here. He said, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You see, when everything around you and everyone around you questions God's word, hold fast to the truth. In this world that's Everything seems to be so relative, something, everything, truth it seems to be something that you can, you can kind of say that this is my truth and that is your truth, and, and truth can be, have a different definition, definition to other people. But what Jesus is really saying here is that hold fast to my word. Hold fast to the word of God. This is where we find truth. We cannot create truth. Truth is not based on our feelings, it's not based on our opinions, but it's based on solely the Word of God. And in this, in this world of compromise, in this world of, of relativism, where I can create my own truth, you have your truth and I have my truth. But it's only in the Word of God that we find the truth from our Creator. And he says in verse 10, And since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world and test, to test the inhabitants of the earth. And he says this, I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. And to the church of Laodicea, John received this revelation from Jesus Christ, and he wrote it down, and he gave it to the angel of the church of Laodicea. And this was Jesus' encouragement to the church of Laodicea. It says, turn up the temperature. Turn up the temperature. And here we need to turn down the temperature a little bit, but he's, he, he's speaking to them. Turn up the temperature. He says, I know your deeds. Jesus is saying to them, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold or hot. I wish that you're either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Oh, Jesus, that's harsh. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I like my coffee either cold or hot. I don't like lukewarm coffee. If, I'm, if, I, if I take a sip of lukewarm coffee, I'm just going to want to spit it out of my mouth. Do not like it. Anybody with me? I don't like lukewarm steak. I like hot steak. I don't like cold steak. Some things I like hot. Some things I like cold. Either or. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He'd rather that you be either or. There's not just halfway. We don't follow Jesus halfway. We're all in or we're all out. There is no in-between. He draws the line. And we as believers and followers of Jesus Christ need to, need to resist lukewarm Christianity with everything that is within us. Because, you know, it gets so tempting and so easy to draw back. It's so easy to be comfortable and be at ease. And be lulled to sleep in our faith. And Jesus is saying here that we need to be hot. We need to be on fire for God. We need to be in a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. Our hearts need to be ablaze. With love for Jesus. And love for the lost. And love for those around us. And Jesus said in, in Revelation 3.19. He said to those whom I love I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. And this church was deceived by lukewarmness. This, this, this church was deceived by the riches of life. And they had an attitude of, we don't need anything. I'm all set. I'm good. I'm rich. But they didn't realize that they were actually poor. You see, even though we're experiencing lukewarmness in our spiritual life and we're experiencing a place of lukewarmness, he still invites us into a relationship with him. He invites us into a place where he can restore that passion, that fire deep inside of our heart. I'm going to might come up and we're going to close this today. 
And today, the overarching principle I want you to take home today is this word. It's surrender. It's surrender. Living a life of surrender before him. Surrendering to his will, surrendering to his word, surrendering to the king of kings and lord of lords. And it brings life and it brings freedom and it brings, and it brings deliverance into our life as, as, we, as we learn the art of surrender before Jesus. And today as we pray, as we bow every head bowed, every eye closed. And Jesus says this to the church. He also said this in Revelation 3.20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Many times we read this think he's talking to unbelievers, but he's actually talking to the church here. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens a door, I'll come in and eat with him. And he with me. I believe that God today wants to restore and renew and bring you back to the first love, to renew and restore that passion, to set some hearts ablaze for God in this place today. And what I wanted to do, us to do, I want, I want Mike to lead us in worship and one last song and as we stand together right now, I want us to lift up our hands and cry out to God. Lord, bring, renew me, restore me, refresh me. Lord, I give my life to you new and fresh today. I worship you with all of my heart. Forgive me for the lukewarmness, for the compromise in my life. And Lord, today I surrender all those areas of my life that aren't surrendered to you. Today, I commit my life to you anew and afresh.